Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Today we begin a series entitled, uh, Why the Church Just Wants Your Money. So turn to your neighbor and say, why does the church want my money? A teacher comes up to little Johnny and goes, little Johnny, if you have a dollar and you go and ask your dad for another dollar plus 50 cents, how much are you going to have? And little Johnny looks at her and he goes, a dollar. And she shakes her head and goes, little Johnny, you don't know your basic math. And little Johnny turns back to her and goes, Miss Teacher, you don't know my daddy. <laughs> no, I don't know little Johnny's daddy, but I do know my Heavenly Father. My Heavenly Father is more focused on your generosity than he is your currency. He's more concerned about your health spiritually than he is about your monetary wealth. That's who our daddy is. So today we begin a series entitled, Why the Church Wants Your Money. And I know that I want to just, you know what? I just want to begin by answering that specific question right up here on the front end. Why does the church want your money. I don't know why other churches want your money, but here's why the church wants your money. Because God wants us to do what he would do if he were us. God wants us to do and to be what he would be or do if he were us. And we are to be imitators of him. And so we are to be the solution to some of the problems that we find here on This earth. So this morning, um, we're going to take a look at the brother of Jesus, a guy by the name of James. But in order for us to be a solution to some of the problems, we have to first take a look at a problem. We have to begin with the problem. A few days ago, I was looking for a snack. And I was looking for a container that looked something like this. Uh, but there was one missing. Um, these are like blueberry muffins and stuff. And there was one missing. But I knew I still had three more to go. And I was uh, going to the kitchen looking for it because we always put it in a certain area. And I couldn't find it. I was like, man, there's no way. Hayden doesn't eat sweets. And Natalie doesn't eat a whole lot of sweets. But Natalie does have a tendency to hide stuff. <laughs> in the name of I'm saving it. And so I'm looking for it. I'm like, man, she's stashing this thing away from me or something. I'm I'm looking around. And sure enough, I find it on top of our oven in a cabinet that has no business being way up there. As a matter of fact, she can barely reach that thing. So I find it and I pull it out, but I had a problem. I looked at it and there was a whole bunch of hairs on those muffins. It was not good. The problem was is that we didn't consume this thing fast enough. And now that I found it, it was good for nobody. It was not good at all. And today when we take a look at the book of James or the brother of Jesus, James, James also, uh, in a similar way, reminds us of of a similar truth about holding on to stuff a little bit too long. And he has this idea that I want to share with you, and it goes something like this. He says, start giving while you're living because what you're holding is a molding. Can you guys repeat that with me? Start giving while you're living because what you're holding is a molding. And now, because you've held it a whole lot longer than it should have, now it's not good for anyone. And so you got to get rid of it. James, the brother of Jesus... Uh, in the first century, he was a pastor of um, the church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and we're going to take a look at his life because he lived there in Jerusalem and he writes a letter to the first century Christians. And in this letter, he addresses them and he addresses us with some truth that I think that we need to pay attention to as we move into this holiday season. So now warning, I have a warning I want you to know that I'm not saying this. James is saying this, okay? You know, if you have an issue, talk to James. All right, he's here. He's actually, he's back there in the back. There he is right there. There's James right there. I'm not mad 
But James is admonishing as a pastor the people in his congregation. So if you want uh, to look at notes, if you can go on your app, you'll see the notes there. It's James, the fifth chapter. We'll take a look at verses one through six. And he starts with this. He says, now listen, you rich people. We can stop right there. And we can just say, look, well, I know he ain't talking about me. I'm out of this deal. And you're looking around saying, I wonder who he's talking about. I know who he's talking about. He's talking about Jeremiah Roby. He's talking about some of these other guys. But he ain't talking about me. You know, a few years ago, I did a message uh, addressing this kind of an issue. And basically, the, the bottom line was, we are richer uh, than we think we really are. We are more richer than we think we really are. And the reason why we don't think so is because we don't feel rich. None of us feels rich. I haven't felt rich in such a long time. As a matter of fact, I think the time that I have felt the most riches is when I have got my first paycheck. Just when I was 13, 14 years old, I had no Natalie, I had no obligations, <laughs> I had no, no nothing. But I went to go work for my uncle, my Uncle Pete, in construction. And after, you know, picking up boards, following him around, him feeding me lunch, whatever, he gives me a check on a Friday, and it was almost $200. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm filthy rich. I don't have nothing. What am I going to do with all this money? And that's probably the last time I've ever felt rich. <laughs> now, many of us here in this room, uh, how many guys feel rich? Many of us don't feel rich in this room, you guys are lying. <laughs> and the reason why a lot of us don't feel rich is because we have no financial margin. Everything that comes in goes out. As a matter of fact, by the time you get your paycheck, your paycheck's already speaking to you. It's already spent. Anybody ever been there? I have. Man, that's like, that's a great response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you have no margin, you have what? No peace. No margin, no peace. Many of us have earned the most we've ever made in our entire life, yet we're still under financial pressure because we have no margin. Another reason why we don't uh, feel rich is because we can see what everybody wears. We can see what everybody drives. We can see where everybody lives. We have this thing called social media and Instagram and Facebook and all this stuff is like, and you're looking and you're scrolling, it's like, man, I wish I could, I could take all those trips like Pastor Joel. <laughs> I wish I could have a car like that. And so if we're not careful, next thing you know, as we're scrolling, we become a little bit envious. We want what they got. And it never, it never stops, right? We fall into this trap. It's called a comparison trap. And it's never ever fair when you begin to compare. But here's the truth about uh, being rich. By international standards, here's the stats. If you have a household income of $33,000, you are in what they call the 1% club. If you make $33,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the people, not in this country, but in the world. You might not feel rich, but you are. Now, no one ever cheers about that. Honey, we made the, we're in the 1% club. <laughs> we finally made it, right? <laughs> and listen, I just want to preface this. That the goal here is not to make you feel guilty, but to make you feel more responsible. Because that's the idea. It's that we have a responsibility. But the truth about it is this. There are millions and millions of people who think you are filthy, filthy rich. Back to James. First century thinking. First century thinking, the idea back then was if you were blessed, if you were rich, God's favor was upon you. God was happy with you. God was uh, pleased with you. You were God's favorite. But if you were poor or sick, God didn't love you very much. But that's leftovers, that's Old Testament thinking. The New Testament thinking, the truth is this, rich people aren't more loved, but rich people are more responsible. 
Why? Because we have more opportunities to do uh, the things that God wants us to do because he has blessed us. We're more accountable to do more. We're more accountable to love more. We're uh, more accountable to serve more, to give more, to share more. Why? Because we have more opportunities. So James goes on. He goes, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail <laughs> because of the miseries that are coming upon you. And James is saying, he goes, hey, listen, you think you have a future and a secure future because you're rich, but he's saying your future is not as secure as you think. You know, a lot, of, a lot of us think that rich people never have anything to worry about. Why? Because they have all this money, they have this extra, they have IRAs, they have insurance, they have retirement, etc. But James also knew that the more you have, he's smart. James also knew, he was the brother of Jesus. But he also knew that the more you have, the more you worry. The more you have, the more anxiety that comes upon you. Because folks that have some and more, they was like, man, that's not enough. What if the stock market crashes? What if uh, inflation continues to go up? What if my wife leaves and takes everything and gives it to some other knucklehead? What if my you know, husband leaves? What if I get sick? What if all this stuff happens? We don't mean to do this, but uh, uh, um, little by little, we, we, we drift that way. And we become anxious and we become more worried. And the rich man's mistake, if you want to know what your mistake is, rich people, <laughs> if you want to know what a rich man's mistake is, the rich man's mistake is this, is this, is that they put their trust in riches. They put their trust in wealth rather than the one who richly provides. I've done this before. All of a sudden I get a lump sum of money and I'm like, I don't care about anything. Income tax comes, seven thousand, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars. I'm like, I don't have to worry about anything. But then when it's all gone, Jesus. <laughs> Poor people, they don't do this. Why? Because they don't have anything. <laughs> so Jane goes on to say, he says, Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Okay, let me just say this. James He's pretty black and white, okay? He's basically taking his congregation and he's taking them behind a shed and just kind of spanking them. And that's not how I want this to come across, but if it comes across that way, that's okay. Just listen to that. He's admonishing his congregation. He goes, the moths have eaten your clothes and your gold and your silver are corroded. Come on, James, chill out a little bit. In other words, he's saying, man, you've got so much stuff You've got so much clothes, you can't even wear it all. If you go into your closet, there's all kinds of clothes with tags still on it. There's stuff in there that you wish one day you could wear, but you're waiting for you yourself to lose 10 pounds. <laughs> I've got stuff in there. Man, I don't wear size 32 pants anymore. They've been there for 15 years. I finally was like, man, let's get rid of these things. Let's give them to some skinny people. <clears throat> he says, so much gold and silver, it's now beginning to tarnish. It's now beginning to rot. It's beginning to chip away because they're not meant to last for eternity. Your wealth, he says, is rotting. And now it's not any good for anything or anybody. Is that what he says? Anybody ever have um, in your house or in your office? I got a couple of them. Uh, what they call a junk drawer. Yes. Or you call it the save it for later drawer. The other day I was opening up the drawer here at the office and uh, I noticed that there was two, I two iPhones in there. I'm like, I don't know how long they've been in there. It's like, what am I doing with this stuff? I looked in Natalie's closet. Don't tell her I said that. She's not here. <laughs> She's actually in the other room. She'll find out, I'm sure. <laughs> I looked in her closet. She's got a bunch of boxes everywhere. And I opened up a box, and it's an old Palm Pilot. You remember? Anybody remember those? It's like it was, had the stylus and everything. It was like really cool. But I started thinking, it's like, man, the point is I could have sold that stuff, or I could have just given it away or sold it and got the money and blessed somebody with it. But instead, I decided to hold on to it in the name of I'll need it one day. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? If you go into your garage, it's like, 
No, I got to hold on to that bolt. I got to hold on to that because one day I'm going to need that extra trash can or extra blower or whatever it is. The other day I was seeding my, the grass and the thing messed up, the thing, the propeller thing messed up. And I'm thinking, it's like, why am I, why do I keep messing with this thing? And I was like, but I'll, I'll make it work one day. And I started thinking because I was prepping for this message. So I grabbed it and I choked it. It's like, good for you. <laughs> Actually, I need to get it out of the trash because I could easily fix it and give it to you guys. If you're looking for a weed feeder thing, just call me. I'll get you one, okay? I'll fix it. But James is basically saying, the issue is this. It's not what comes in. The issue is what stacks up. What's stacking up? It's not what's coming in. And James continues to hammer them, and he hammers us, and he just kind of opens up our eyes to see some things. He goes, their corrosion will testify against you. The corrosion he's talking about is the stuff that you're holding on to, that you're being irresponsible with, that's going to you know, weaken its value. It's becoming less and less valuable. He goes, that's what he's called corrosion. It's going to testify against you. He goes, we think we're being responsible by holding on to it, but one day what we thought was good by saving it is going to now testify against us, is what he's saying. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. <laughs> like, chill out, James. <laughs> um, that's common God's judgment type of language in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, but it's pretty much judgment of God type of language. In the ancient days, uh, the people would be judged publicly. They would also be tried and punished publicly. A lot of times, um, they were violently you know, beaten and uh, bruised and sometimes put to death publicly. But James believed that one day, God would hold you and I accountable uh, for mishandling the stuff that he provided for us. Isn't that the truth? Today, most people don't believe that God has a firm hand. Most people don't believe that God punishes anyone. You know, we live in this, everyone gets a trophy generation. Everything is just, you know, God is love and he is love and he's compassionate and he's kind and he's merciful. But there is also something called accountability. And there is also something called afterlife. James believed that this life was not the only thing that we needed to focus on. That there is something that's going to happen after this life, after we leave this earth. Why did he believe that? Because he saw his own brother get crucified on that cross they buried him in a grave, and three days later, he saw him again, and he spoke truth to him again, and he saw him get lifted up and leave this earth into heaven. So if anyone believed in afterlife, it would be James, the brother of Jesus. He saw him get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Amen. And Jesus is alive, and I'm here to tell you, listen, there is an afterlife. There is eternal life. And James not only saw him as his brother, but James at one time, at first he didn't believe, but James now saw Jesus not only as his brother, but as his Lord, as his Savior and his Lord. So James goes on, he goes, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. And the idea is this, he goes, man, the time is too short. Why do you keep hoarding? Don't you know that the, your time is short? Why hoard when your time is short? And here's what all of us know. You're going to run out of time before you run out of stuff. Isn't that the truth? We're all going to run out of time before we run out of stuff. Have you ever had to um, clean up after uh, someone you loved, deceased, passed away? Maybe a grandfather, grandmother, mom or dad, or brother, or whatever, or son. You have to clean up. You have to go there and clean all that stuff out. And whenever you're doing that, you're thinking to yourself, why do they have all this stuff? It's impossible. They couldn't possibly wear all this clothes. They couldn't possibly, you know, put all this furniture. They got, you know, more stuff outside in the shed with full of furniture, and they got seven 
you know, blow dryers and all this kind of stuff. And you're thinking, what in the world? They can't drive all this stuff. They can. You can only blow dry your hair one blow dryer at a time. Why do they have all this stuff? And suddenly, at one time, the people that you love, they valued that. Man, they held on to that. They valued that. But now, as you're getting rid of it, the things that they valued now has become a hindrance in you. And you're just trying to get rid of it. Here, just take this, take this, take this. Does make sense? What if, I'm just thinking one day, I don't know how to do this. I don't know if it's even possible. I would love to leave this earth and breathe my last and none of my kids and no one has to be concerned about anything. It's already all taken care of. The inheritance is gone. Everything has been gifted away. And the kids are going to be like, dad didn't leave me nothing. Now you were a bad boy. You were a bad boy. <laughs> Here's what I know about my kids and my grandkids. What we do now will determine the story they're going to tell and the example that they see. How they see me manage my stuff is a story that one day will come out in their lives. How they see me do that and what they experience afterwards, they're going to tell a story. And James isn't even finished yet. He goes on to say, he goes, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. Now he's talking to people who were rich and they had their own business. They had employees. And it was very common back then for people to hire people who were in need and they would promise them one thing, but they wouldn't put it out when it was all said and done. They would find a legal way, they would find a loophole to not uh, give them what was deserving of them. Why? Because the people that were poor, they had no recourse, they had nothing else. And so he's telling them, he goes, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And I don't know about you, but listen, this is kind of sobering for me, and it should be sobering to all of us. God notices stuff like this. Here's something that we all should consider. The resourced people shouldn't look for loopholes to get by with doing less. Resourced people should look for opportunities to do more with those things that God has blessed us with. Isn't that the truth? Now, I know for some of us here, some of us either are young in the faith or some of us have not crossed over the line of faith. And you're not even thinking that there's a God who does that kind of stuff. You're not even thinking of an afterlife because your thinking is goes something like this. I don't owe anybody anything because I've earned every penny I have. Some people have that thought. And you know what? If this is all there is to life, Man, just keep going out to Myron Steakhouse, take some few vacations, go on some trips, take me along every now and then, and everything's going to be cool. You're justified. But what if there is an afterlife? What if there is truth about what James is saying? I happen to, uh, to have a conviction that the manuscript that is written here by the brother of Jesus, James, is something that is absolutely true. And I also know that when I read the New Testament, here's what Jesus tells me. I am not an owner. I'm a manager. I'm a steward. He owns everything. And the manager is always subject to, is always accountable to the owner. And one day, I'm going to be accounted for this. Not only the bad side, but the good side too. One day, I will be commended for my hard work. I'll be applauded for my heart. Man, Marcus, you did awesome. You don't have anything, but you gave it all away. That's awesome. One day I'll be applauded for being responsible and congratulated for, for taking those opportunities that God has given us and seizing those opportunities. As a matter of fact, you've probably heard me say this. God's gift to me and God's gift to you are the opportunities that are set before you. Your gift to him is seizing those opportunities to glorify his name on this work. So I see in scripture that we will be commended for our hard work, but also in the New Testament, we're commanded to be generous, to give more, to share more, to serve more, to love more. Why? Because we have, we have what people need. We can become the solution to some of the problems that we see every day in life. James is almost closing. He goes on to say, he goes, you've lived on earth 
in luxury and self-indulgence. I'd love to be a friend with James. You've lived on this earth with luxury and self. In other words, he's saying, man, all of you guys, you've become greedy. You've become the victim of what we call consumption assumption. If you don't know what consumption assumption is, is if it comes to me, then it's for me. That's what consumption assumption is. If it comes to you, then it's for you. I happen to think a little bit different. If it comes to me, at least I sit there and pray. It's like, God, is this for me? Or is this an opportunity for me to serve somebody else? As a matter of fact, there, there, there's three ways to look at this. I don't know where I got this from, but I remember writing it on the, on the wall of my uh, shop at home. The stuff that comes to us is, is either seed so that we can bless others, or it's either feed for my family, myself and my family, or it's either greed, self-indulgence. You have to evaluate what that is. Hopefully the third one is not something that you just hold on to. It's either, it's either seed, an opportunity to give and bless and be an encouragement and a blessing to others, or it's either feed, or it's probably just greed. He goes, you live this earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Go to that next slide. Is there not another one? You have fattened yourself. <laughs> he doesn't stop, does he? He just keeps drilling and drilling and drilling. It's like, ouch, man, let me heal up for a second. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. Now, what in the world? Now, we've heard that, like in the prodigal son, you know, kill the fatted calf. Back in those days, rich people would, you know, you could only really hold on to um, grain and wine. And some of them had cattle. So they would take a calf and put it in a pen a little pin, and they would begin to overfeed it. They would begin to protect it and watch it until it became fattened and huge. Because one day they knew that there would be something to celebrate. They would have something to celebrate, and they would have something prepared. Now, this didn't take a day or two. This took months and weeks and months in order to get this calf to become a fatted uh, cow and get ready to celebrate for someone. So what James is saying right here, he goes, listen, for us, we don't have to plan ahead. We don't have to plan for money. Man, if somebody, there's a celebration that goes on in our lives. Hey, let's order some uh, barbecue from, you know, H-E-B or Davilas. And it can come within an hour or two. Or let's just get a turkey from Amazon or whatever it is. We don't have to wait months and months and weeks and weeks to prepare ourselves for that. And James is saying, he goes, you have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. In other words, he's saying, rich people, you think you're planning way, way ahead and being responsible and being aware of what should be coming or what's going to be coming up ahead, but you're actually planning for your own embarrassment. You're actually planning and you're preparing. You yourself are becoming um, a fattened calf for the day of slaughter. Now here, let me give you some historical truth. Here's the truth about uh, James. A few years later, after he writes this, James was martyred. He was uh, martyred by, a, he, a high priest actually put him uh, to death illegally because they were tired of him talking about his brother, Jesus. They were switching out governors and what have you. And in that uh, transition, they killed James illegally. Seven years after his death, the rich people that he was addressing found themselves trapped by the Romans. They were murdered. They were enslaved. Many of them died of diseases. And all of their wealth that he was addressing was carted off back to Rome. That's history. You don't see that in the New Testament, but you do see it in a book where Josephus writes about what took place. Seven years later after uh, this takes place. So the moral of this whole passage, what's the moral of it? You better give while the giving is good. Or we can say it like we said it earlier. Start giving while you're living because what you're holding is a molding. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.